The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, New Testament scholar Dr. Douglas Campbell looks at the gospel of grace in a new way, challenging the model of a contractual grace. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, in your book, The Deliverance of God, you focus a great deal on Romans 5 through 8 and the very positive, uh, powerful assurance of salvation that is present in those passages. Mm. And the question that seems to arise when we talk about the power and the strength and assurance of grace, which is most assuredly present, are all these uh, uh, nagging questions uh, about the, uh, the buts, mm -hmm. the uh, but syndrome when it comes to grace right. but. Uh, what are some of those and, and how do we work with those? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people resist the gospel of grace for three reasons. Um, they're worried about judgment, they're worried about ethics, and they're worried about sin. Um, and they see those things as connected together. And, and what one runs into here is um, an inability to step outside of an essentially conditional mentality where people think, if I can't threaten you with something, if I can't threaten you with a negative and a positive future state, how can I get you to behave well? Exactly. So I'll be soft on sin, I won't be doing my ethical job, and I'll have let judgment go, and all these things are held together. Now I think probably, while this is a model that is pursued with the best of intentions, I think it's basically wrong on all counts. It's, it's wrong as an account of judgment, wrong as an account of ethics, wrong as an account of sin, and wrong about how people behave. Most importantly, it's wrong about God. Um, the gospel really wants to do things very differently. So perhaps if we talk about that for a little bit, we can come back and see where the, the fallacies lie in these sorts of protests. But the gospel of grace addresses ethics and sin in a very, very radical way. It says to you um, immediately, basically, you are so sinful that you can contribute nothing to this process. Now that's a very strong judgment on your sinfulness and what needs to change. Um, and people sense this. The gospel of grace, the flip side of the gospel of grace, is this very stern word of judgment. So you say to me, well, how do I behave once this gospel of grace arrives? Does it just let me do whatever I want? Well, absolutely not, to quote Paul, who says that a lot, especially about this question. Um, you're involved in a transformed reality now that you really have to cooperate with as much as you possibly can. You need to throw yourself into this new reality, and it asks that of you. It asks you to respond to all these new relationships that you're in. And it will take every ounce of willpower and effort that you have and more to continue to respond to the Spirit and the presence of Christ in your life. This is really what true freedom is. Um, as we respond in these relationships. We discover what liberty is, what it means to be set free from sin, from the tyranny of death, corruption, and sin, uh, and to be free to live for God as God wants us to live. Now, that's true freedom, uh, but it's freedom that you have to be involved with. It's, it's real freedom. You are doing this. Uh, but what you're not doing is choosing to step away from it or choosing to be involved with it. It's a relationship that's given to you that you then need to respond to. So it's really the freedom of response and the response of freedom. Um, and, and this is something that's hard for us to grasp because it's a very non-modern, non-Western way of understanding freedom. But if I could put it like this, it's rather like when a beautiful chord is played on a piano. Um, certain notes that are in harmonic resonance with this chord will resonate with it, um, and it's as if God is playing this chord, and we are free to resonate 
with what God is doing in our lives and to fit into with this magnificent orchestration. If, if God is not playing this chord, we're not free, nothing happens, we're on earth. But when that chord is played and when we are struck, when that note is struck, we resonate, and that is the freedom of God. Now we can, I think, push back on that and refuse to resonate. We can reject the freedom that God gives us. We can reject the gift that comes to us, but that's not free. That's not a choice. The Bible calls it sin, and it's actually an irrational decision for slavery. I wouldn't grace that whole operation uh, with the word freedom. So really what I'm saying is, when the gospel of grace comes to us, it reshapes our understanding of what true human freedom is. And as our minds are reshaped, and our responses are reshaped, I think we live as we're meant to live. Uh, and we see more clearly why these other ways of approaching ethics and judgment and sin are wrong. And you can probably see by now where I'm going with this in terms of um, how when someone protests against the gospel of grace and says it's soft on sin, I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Because when, when I'm looking at grace, I'm seeing something that see, treats sin with incredible seriousness. When I'm in this relationship of grace and I know that God accepts me in Christ, I'm actually then free to see myself as I really am. I'm free to see the depth of the sin in my life. Uh, because I'm secure. Without fear. Exactly. I know that I cannot fall out of his loving embrace. And so I can be honest in a way that I cannot be honest in any other situation or system. And, and there's a huge freedom in that. Oh, it's, 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 there is a liberation. All the burdens are, are, are lifted. Uh, there are no more pretenses. The burdens are lifted, but the reality is sometimes slightly horrible. <laughs> because you begin to go on a journey uh, when I think you really do get exposed to depths of sin that you hadn't even suspected were there. So a confessional quality becomes part of your discipleship. I think it becomes part of Christian leadership, uh, where the deeper we go with God, the more sense, unfortunately, we have of our own struggle with sin, the more we appreciate the enormous accomplishment of Christ on our behalf, who shared this horrendous situation and didn't slip into that. But I, I think it produces a more honest church culture. A more, I hope it produces a slightly more honest culture of discipleship. Um, there are some lessons about sinfulness that I didn't even smell a whiff of until I'd been a Christian for probably 15 or 20 years. And then all of a sudden, bang, you're confronted by something that you do that's a pattern of behavior that it's actually been in your life from the get-go, and suddenly God is asking you to address that, say, an issue like violence. You can't even see how deeply immersed you are in violence. The one day the Holy Spirit, perhaps through an incident, uh, puts his finger on it and says, OK, it's time for you to address this now. And that is an utterly painful experience, but it's the sort of repentance that needs to happen in Christian lives. And I, I put it to you that it's taking sin incredibly seriously um, in an ongoing way. Now, if you're pushing the other kind of model, the one that I'm not so happy with, the more conditional contractual model, and you're, you're protesting against my emphasis on grace, and you're saying, well, what about sin? Aren't you soft on sin? I'm saying, no, you're soft on sin. If you're approaching the gospel as if sin is something that you learn about and confess before you become a Christian, I think you're treating sin in a trivial way. You're approaching sin as if you can understand it without God revealing this stuff to you in an ongoing way is if you can understand sin without being confronted by the reality of Christ. You're treating sin as if it's something that you and your sinful situation can deal with yourself so that you can become a Christian. Well, that utterly trivializes sin. Um, and then the assumption seems to be that through your good actions, you've left it at the door of the church when you walked in and became a Christian. You didn't leave it at the door of the church. It walked into church with you, unfortunately, and comes back to grab you time after time. So I have a deep worry that this fairly conditional contractual approach to the gospel actually doesn't treat sin with sufficient seriousness. So I find it ironic when I get accused by advocates of that gospel of being too soft on sin myself. Um, 
I also think that they're soft on ethics. Basically, there's this belief that human beings have it in them to generate a certain amount of good behavior in order to become a Christian, before they become a Christian. Once you're a Christian, you kind of keep on with the good work. But I think this is, this is deluded about the depth of sin in the human condition. We cannot generate good behavior and good deeds until God has come down and transformed us and changed us. This is a wildly over-optimistic evaluation of human ability and capacity. Um, these are things that I've learned from, I think, standing in a tradition of grace, standing in a reality of grace, that I think that the tradition has understood and stood in as well. Isn't there also the, the um, idea of, of um, being forgiven, uh, to have sin, uh, your, your past sins removed, and then, then the concept that, well, now the, now the Spirit will come and help you right. uh, maintain right. some level of righteousness uh, right. rather than the bottle you're talking about. Right. This, yeah, the kind of the false model has this sort of funny two-step pattern where you get sins wiped away and then you step through into the church by, by doing certain, certain things, for example, by making a decision of faith supposedly, makes you a Christian. Then the Holy Spirit arrives, like the Seventh Cavalry, to help you out when you get into a diff difficult situation. Um, again, there's something a little odd about that. What really seems to be going on is the Spirit is involved from well before your involvement, uh, from the foundation of the world. The Spirit with Christ has been working towards your and my inclusion in all of this. And the Spirit has been working on your journey, uh, often when you're not aware of it, I'm sure leading you to an understanding of Christ, of the church, of God, of sin. Um, so they're all involved together. And this is so much more than forgiveness of sins. It is forgiveness of sins, but it's release from sin. There's a, a little word play that Paul does here on the genitive connection in the Greek. You can talk about forgiveness of sins or forgiveness of transgressions, um, in which really... The transgressions are the object of the forgiveness. I'm going to forgive those sins over there. But there's also, with the same word, a sense of release from sins, which becomes release from sin in Paul. It's genitive of separation, where we're getting released out of or away from the sin. And this is talking about actually changing us, not wiping away acts, but changing the way we function. So we don't act in that way. And this transformation uh, has to do with, with uh, being in Christ in a way that his, uh, he's our life, he is our righteousness. And again, it isn't yeah. our... Absolutely. Um, there's a danger that when God comes to us in grace, we then think, okay, so much has been done for me, now it's over to me to respond. <laughs> Possibly I've been overemphasizing that. There's a sense in which grace from God doesn't just come all the way to us, it, it takes us back as well in Christ. Uh, Christ is the one who has walked in the way that we couldn't walk. Um, it's as if we're in a massive snowdrift, helpless, bound there. But Christ is the one that has smashed a furrow through the snow. We walk behind him, he pulls us, he carries us behind him through the snow. Um, so God hasn't just come all the way uh, down to us. He's also pulling us in Christ all the way back to him. So all of our acting and our responding, in a way, is an echoing of Jesus' perfect response for us. Uh, we see this again in Romans 8. We see so much in Romans 8, um, where Paul talks about prayer, for example. And we struggle. We don't know what to pray. But then we realize the Spirit is praying in a deeper way than we can pray. And Christ is praying for us as well. So what's really going on there is Christ is continually offering up prayer to the Father. The Spirit is offering up prayer to the Father, obviously knowing a lot more about the situation than we do. And we're entering into that prayer that is being undertaken on our behalf. So it's a, it is a gift that comes all the way down and goes all the way back. It's a, it's a marvelous thing. You'd never dream this up. I mean, you couldn't think of this. 
This is, this is not something that a clever person has thought up. This is an act of God. So we're participating in the prayers of Christ and don't have to Absolutely. worry about whether our prayers are good enough. We don't have to be anxious. We just have to respond to this divine communion that is doing things on our behalf. And really all our activity is like that. We're caught up into the worship. Uh, we're caught up into worship in Christ. Uh, we're caught up into um, the behavior of Christ by the Spirit of Christ. Um, we're caught up in the understanding of Christ, the mind of Christ, the faithfulness of Christ is something we're caught up into as well. We don't have to generate this ourselves. Uh, this is what God is, is giving us. It's, it's a gift that's so much bigger than we realize. And yet, Paul knew this. I mean, when he wrote in Ephesians, I want to pray that you would have power to grasp with all the saints the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of the love of Christ, which is past all understanding. He, he understood that you could fall forever into the love of Christ. That's a pretty, pretty powerful and expansive benevolence, is it not? <laughs> so our, our faith that we, at the time of, of, of believing, mm, mm. Uh, should not be thought of as a work that we're offering no. that causes God to change his mind about mm, us, mm. causes God to look at us in a new way. No, not at all. It isn't the beginning point no. of our salvation or so. even our transformation. I don't think so. It's actually, um, this is where we can get Paul wrong by turning faith into a deed or a work that accesses all the benefits of Christ. It's like our uh, Visa card, trot off to the ATM with it, get the money out of the account. Without the card, you don't get any of the good stuff. No, this is a misunderstanding of Paul. Uh, faith is actually something that for Paul, Christ has as well as us. So in us, it's a fruit of the Spirit. So it's very important, but it's a sign that we are in Christ and are responding to the Father as Christ himself did. So there's a sense in which faith has got, got many dimensions. It, it's understanding, correct understanding of what's going on, which obviously is important. One, one of the most important elements of which is that we understand what sort of God we're involved with, the God of love. Uh, it involves trust, unwavering trust, and involves fidelity through suffering. Uh, when struggles come, we can be faithful. These are all signs, I think, that the Spirit is bearing fruit in our lives and that we're echoing the character of Christ. Um, so here I'm using this reading of um, a couple of phrases in Paul that the King James Version got right when it translated them as the faith of Christ and that modern translations concerned to emphasize this decision making a role for faith, unfortunately, changed. They reinterpreted them so they became faith in Christ. And that recently, scholars have begun turning back into the faith of Christ. Some scholars have begun, reala begun realizing that this makes better sense of the texts um, where these phrases occur. And I'm, I'm persuaded by that. I think they're right. The very fact that it's the fruit of the Spirit. Mm. Uh, oftentimes, we'll, we'll hear a sermon uh, or a Bible study uh, or a group and the fruit of the Spirit will be listed yes. and read from Galatians. And then, uh, then the admonishment is to uh, start <laughs> right. living like this. Because after all, right. this is the fruit of the Spirit. So you need to get more of this in your right. life. Mm. Isn't that kind of turning around the whole it point? It is missing the point. <laughs> um, it's not that we're not involved. Um, God wants a response from us. And, and we, we are fully involved in this. Um, but it is, I think, true that we don't have to generate this out of our own resources. We're not thrown back on ourselves. Um, and we don't have to strive to produce these sorts of things as proof that we're involved in the reality of Christ. We can chill out to a large extent and attend to the, the glories of the gospel, respond to it as best we can. And Christ and the Spirit will do this work through us. There is, I think, a restfulness and a, and a, and a sense of relaxation about people that, that, that are grasped by this truth. Paul would say, people that grasp this truth because they're grasped by this truth. Uh, and I think this is a hallmark of people that are walking in grace. Going back to the uh, title of the book, Deliverance of God. Yes. Um, 
the subhead, of course, an apocalyptic rereading of justification in Paul. Why is it an apocalyptic rereading of justification in Paul? Very good question. Um, what I'm getting at there is that there's a, there's a bad way of reading Paul, a way that um, obviously I don't approve of and that I think gets him wrong. And that, that reading of Paul produces a false model of the gospel. And I think it springs up out of what we could call Paul's justification texts. So these are passages where he uses justification words, which in the Greek are using the dikaio stem. So we could call them in Greek as dikaio texts. And in those texts, Paul is doing something interesting with faith and works. Works of law over here, faith over there. Someone's being justified or dikaioed. And there's also the righteousness of God running around. Now those are the texts out of which um, a very conditional, contractual understanding of the gospel has been generated, particularly, I think, since the second and third generations after the Reformation. I think this is when the damage was done. I don't think the main reformers uh, got this wrong. There's a little bit of it going on. But Calvin, Luther, um, I don't get this, this sense when I read them. But later on, second, third generation, um, certain theological systems were developed in a very conditional and contractual way. And these are the ones that did the damage. To understand Paul properly, I think we need to eliminate this false dogmatic way of reading Paul. And the way that we eliminate it from the justification texts is we grasp they're all about revelation. Um, particularly when Paul is talking about faith. And that's what I mean by apocalyptic. Apocalyptic is just a, a fancy word for um, revelation. It's the Greek word for revelation. Apocalypsis is Greek. Revelare is the verb um, in Latin. Uh, so what I'm getting at is there's nothing conditional or contractual going on in these justification texts. Paul is really talking about the disclosure of the good purposes of God through the faithfulness of Christ, which elicits from us a response and an echo of faith uh, as we're involved in that. And this is really what Paul is talking about in all these texts. Now, we've tended to miss that because we've taken away the faith of Christ and we've taken that faith and made it into an action that we undertake. So we've made these texts about, about human beings uh, and about conditions that we can fulfill. But I don't think that's what Paul was actually writing. When he says the dikaio theu, the righteousness of God, or, or even better, the deliverance of God, has been revealed through Pistis Christu, He's talking about the faith of Christ. It's Jesus' faithfulness to death on the cross and his resur resurrection where we see God's definitive righteous purpose revealed. Uh, and when we miss that, we, we really misunderstand and misconstrue all of Paul's teaching about salvation. It's a great tragedy that's gripped a lot of the conservative church as well as, I mean, we're used to saying that the liberal church has messed things up because they've dumped the Bible and wandered off. Um, but the conservative church, tooth and nail, will defend us as the true gospel in a very great tragedy, I think, for the church, was really what was going on uh, in Paul was the antithesis of this gospel. And it's, it's time for us to recover that. It seems like the, uh, the Christian walk is a lot more fun and enjoyable yes. than it's often made out to be by Absolutely. those who seem to take it seriously, seem to take it seriously in the sense of being uh, very sober and, and uh, uptight, mm -hmm. um, unable to uh, enjoy themselves, unable to have fun with other people. And it's just, it's just not fun. It's, mm. it's a, mm. a burden mm. Mm. as opposed to a joy. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, Because it's laced with fear. I think so, yeah. Well, it, it, what can be joyful about being flung back on your own resources yeah. and asked to satisfy? Especially when you have none, what? so you have to pretend you have some, which That's leads worse. to judgmentalism <laughs> and to condemnation and to uh, everything that divides people 
instead of bringing them together. Mm. And hanging over your head is this fearsome scenario of what's going to happen at the end of the age, and, and you're worried, you don't have any sense of assurance. So in the gospel, there is no fear of the judgment. Perfect love drives out fear. Yeah. Uh, very true. I don't believe that God wants us to be afraid for a millisecond of anything except perhaps our own stupidity. <laughs> and there's a solution for that by trusting him over against our stupidity. That's right, trusting what God tells us about ourselves instead of what we perhaps want to believe about ourselves. That's a, that's a, that would take uh, another full interview or more, wouldn't it? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> what, what do you do for recreation, for hobbies? Um, I have fun. Uh, I mainly do, I follow the suggestions of my wife, who is an expert at having fun. Um, and we have cats and dogs. We run, we do Pilates and yoga, we go to the beach, we travel. Um, spend time with the kids, watch a lot of films, read. We have a terrific life. I mean, I'm, I feel positively guilty about the amount of enjoyment that I get out of life. <laughs> But you can't have fun in your spare time. You're not having fun at, at work often. What's your next project? Ah. What project are you involved in that we'll eventually see? The, well, people are asking me to write a slightly shorter version of The Deliverance <laughs> of God, and I'm hearing those cries. <laughs> so I think I will. I, I don't know that I always explain myself as well as I, I would like to. And... Um, my sense is, as the feedback is coming in uh, on the big book, uh, folk are not grasping the theological issues with as much clarity as I had hoped. So I obviously need to spell those out a little bit more clearly. And I think I'm getting hold of them more clearly as I, as I talk in situations like this. So a shorter book that shows how to read Romans the right way, um, I think is what I'm going to work on in the next few months. And then after that, I have a very long-running project um, on the life of Paul, because I've always been passionately interested in how he worked as a missionary, uh, where he was, what he was visiting, which ships he sailed on, uh, in a really concrete, gritty way. And I visited most of these cities, so I wanted to write a book about that, and then um, collapse. And uh, I shall come to you for another suggestion. You've been watching You're Included a production of Grace Communion International.